I used to sit in my office at CSC and listen to telephone conversations right here in the city of Ottawa just because I was bored and I had nothing better to do. And everything continues to look normal on the engine. Staying steady at 87% thrust. Il n'y a pas d'ennemis et d'amis, c'est variable dans le temps. While publicly we were told terrorists, enemies, communists, in practice it wasn't. It was, it was all our friends and trading partners. These agencies have power that go above and beyond even their own respective governments. In 1943, at the height of the Second World War, the United States and Great Britain signed an agreement pledging mutual cooperation in the field of electronic surveillance. Together, they succeeded in cracking the Enigma code, used to encrypt German transmissions. Deciphering the enemy's communications meant knowing his strategy meant winning the war. By cracking Enigma, the Allies shortened the war by two years. In 1946, the two-country pact was renamed UK-USA and enlarged to incorporate three new partners, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. The identity of the new enemy is obvious, the communist bloc. Henceforth, a holy spying alliance is sealed between the five states. Today, the Cold War is over, but this secret alliance still exists. Together, the five countries run a giant secret network capable of listening in to the whole planet. Welcome to the biggest espionage operation in the world. Welcome to the Echelon Network. Duncan Campbell is a British investigative journalist specializing in intelligence issues. In 1998, the European community commissioned Campbell to write a report on Echelon. The result was Interception Capabilities 2000, whose publication provoked much discussion. In 1988, Campbell had already revealed the existence of a network of electronic surveillance. His revelations attracted little mainstream interest. Campbell knows the network better than almost anyone. Where he goes, scandal follows. Campbell is the specialist on the Echelon network. Echelon is a code name given by the United States and other countries in the Listening Alliance to some of the stations which intercept communications from commercial satellites. They run a totally integrated worldwide surveillance system in which stations in one country 
will collect information and automatically forward it to American intelligence, whoever wants it. For many years, the electronic communications network that they ran was bigger than the internet itself. And even today, it is very, very large, collecting millions of messages every hour, analyzing them and passing the results around the world. Earthbound signals from telecommunications satellites can be intercepted across vast zones. The Echelon system consists of deploying immense parabolic antennas in these zones in order to intercept illegally the signals carrying our telecommunications. Most often, huge golf balls known as radomes conceal the antenna's orientation. After all, you don't tell someone you're spying on them. The geographical spread of the five partner nations makes possible surveillance of telecommunications worldwide. The information gathered is processed by five national electronic surveillance agencies. Nikki Hager is an investigative journalist from New Zealand. In 1996, he published Secret Power, a wide-ranging inquiry into the New Zealand part of the Echelon network. He even managed to enter a listening station. When I have been secretly to the Waihopai station in New Zealand and looked through the windows there where the operations room is, I've seen the room where it gets broken down into phone calls here and faxes there and emails there, and it's run through these powerful computers which search for all the subjects they're interested in. And actually, there's no people there. The whole system can run itself. We took Duncan Campbell to a location in Cornwall, in southwest England, close to the Morwenstow station, in order to experiment with echelon-style interception techniques. It just it seems strange that the, the plates have been changed over and the situation is now worse than it was before. This is baby echelon. With this very simple system, little battery, a scanner, we can listen to one communication at a time. All we do is we look up at the satellites. You can see how the, the, the aerial that we are using, its antenna is pointed the same way at a nearby satellite to some of the ones which are behind me. Just, just one minute, one minute. That is data. That was the end of a call. That's a fax. Maybe it's Arabic, we don't know. 
هو ممكن طبعا تحصل خناقات وكل حاجه وبتبقى فيها انا برضو فكرت فيها يعني فكرت والله هو الخناق مش هتبقى خناق This is supposed to be a private phone call We don't know where, she could be anywhere in the Western Hemisphere. She could be in Chile, she could be in Poland, or she could be in a ship in the ocean. And this system picks it up because there is no privacy. That is what the British and American and other intelligence services exploit. Signals that travel by satellite are completely not private. And whilst you can have fun as an amateur doing this, um, they invest billions of francs, hundreds of millions of British pounds in spying, exploiting the insecurity of the satellites. I can't do that for you. You're going to have to um, ring somebody. I can't keep ringing you back, so we've got quite a lot on. The main differences between our experiment and Echelon are the number of communications intercepted, the fact that we cannot target certain conversations, and most importantly, the supercomputers which make up the network and which are capable of sifting through millions of intercepted communications. From the USA to Australia and the UK, these computers are all linked together. They are called dictionaries. One can enter, for example, the telephone number or bank account details of a person to be spied upon and the computers go to work. They function much like an internet search engine, but instead of scanning websites, they scan our telecommunications. Mike Frost was a Canadian intelligence agent. He worked for 18 years at the CSE, the Canadian Electronic Surveillance Agency. As a former high-ranking officer, he is perfectly aware of the network's technical capabilities. If these private people were, were holding a conversation and used keywords that is in the, in the computer's dictionary, then that individual would become a target. Yes, all you have to do is, is key the computer and you are now a target. Each partner nation produces a list of themes or keywords which can be changed or updated at will. And the computers go to work. They are able to analyze the contents of emails and file them away accordingly. It's known as semantic intelligence. But they can go one step further. They can use voice recognition. So if an individual has a, a distinctive voice, it is relatively simple today to feed a sample of that voice into the computer and tell the computer, I only want communications containing the word said by this individual. And the computer will do that regardless of, of what method of communications this individual is using, being it his cell phone or his landline or, or whatever. According to the American press, this system, whose code name is VoiceCast, was lent by the NSA to the Colombian authorities hunting Pablo Escobar, the famous drug trafficker. Escobar was shot dead by security forces in December 1993. <laughs> Wayne Madsen was an operative at America's National Security Agency. Now, he works for EPIC, a civil liberties organization.
NSA is the, uh, is the chief. Uh, it's the largest by far. It's larger than all the other signals intelligence agencies put together. It basically is the network control for all these various uh, systems like Echelon and, and other systems that uh, capture these uh, signals of interest. So it's, it's, the, uh, it's, the, it's the granddaddy of all the signals intelligence systems that make up the UK-USA alliance. The NSA has phenomenal power. Fort Meade, its headquarters, is located between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. Here, the NSA receives all the messages intercepted by Echelon across the globe and only redistributes what it chooses to the four other agencies. Of the 38,000 people employed by the NSA, 20,000 are based here. The NSA recruits more mathematicians than any other organization in the world. Its annual budget of $3.6 billion makes it bigger than the FBI and the CIA combined. James Bamford is an American investigative journalist who wrote the authoritative text on the NSA, The Puzzle Palace, in 1983. Bamford uncovered the NSA's amazing history and was even able to enter Fort Meade. The NSA was formed in 1952 by a very secret order. Signed by President Truman. It was, uh, uh, as opposed to the CIA, uh, which was created a few years earlier, CIA was created publicly, but when NSA was formed, it was uh, not known to virtually anybody. And for about the first 10 years, uh, NSA, the very existence of NSA was, was kept secret. The NSA is steeped in the culture of secrecy. Its employees must go to surgeons and dentists recommended by the agency for treatment, just in case they talk under anesthetic. They are encouraged to marry in-house and to have as little contact with the outside world as possible. The NSA is also known by many other names. There's a huge incinerator or a huge uh, document destructor so that millions of pounds of documents every year become um, pulp and uh, they make pizza boxes out of them and they actually sell the pizza boxes so last year they made like sixty thousand uh, dollars selling pizza boxes uh, that were formerly top secret documents and yet echelon cannot access all telecommunications it is only one of many methods of electronic surveillance used by the UK USA powers to listen in on us all. One of my jobs at CSE was to go to our Canadian embassies abroad and technically assess the environment for covert collection of electronic emissions from that embassy. And one of my jobs was to set up the operation and get it running. the equipment must be brought in, usually under cover of diplomatic bag, and uh, set up in the room, and uh, turned on, and uh, you're in business. It can be as simple as a very small antenna, a very small receiver, and a recorder set up in a closet somewhere, and somebody goes up once every two or three days and changes the tape or changes the disc. It could be as small as that, or it could be as complex as the entire top floor of an embassy consisting of 14, 15 people there. For instance, in Paris, very, very complex radio environment. Uh, Tokyo, another city, very, very complex. Protected by diplomatic immunity, embassies are ideal places to install interception devices in order to pick up communications within a given country. 
you see over here, you see that structure at the top that looks something like an Indian teepee with the little lightning rods on top? I watched them build that, I watched them construct it, and I know exactly what's in there. The whole top floor underneath that, where you see no windows, that would be the area where the people are working as we speak. The structure at the end of the building down there is relatively new, and you can see concealed behind the glass is kind of a, a rectangular box with some lightning rods on the top. Well, inside that box, either right now or will be housed very shortly, listening antennas in there. That's one of the methods that they commonly use to conceal their antennas. They have a massive operation going on in there. You can just tell by the size of that structure. That's huge. Who are they listening to? Everybody that's transmitting in this area. Everybody. Probably listening to you and me right now. Canadian people? Oh, sure, of course. Of course they are. The parliament? Sure, absolutely. That's number one. Prime Minister's office, sure. Plus a number of other foreign embassies in this area. Uh, antennas in there would have a clear shot of these structures and these buildings. Signals traveling via underwater cables can also be intercepted. In 1971, the US submarine Halibut taped communications sent along a Soviet military cable. Divers had placed a tap directly on the cable itself. The microwave signals that carry our telecommunications between cities travel in straight lines between antennas spaced generally 30 to 50 kilometers apart. These two can be picked up. Towards the end of the 1960s, the Americans realized that most of the energy from these microwave links went past the target station and went into space. And if you could put a listening satellite in the right position in space, you could hear all of those communications between the cities. Given the success of satellite interceptions, the Americans developed other space vessels capable of targeting on demand our mobile phones, pagers, and computer data. Their code names are Trumpet, Mercury, Advanced Mercury. Their antennas unfold like vast umbrellas, reaching up to 100 meters in diameter. Each one costs one billion dollars. America is the only country in the world to possess such electronic surveillance capabilities. Even its partners have only partial access to it. Too much power frequently leads to the abuse of power. The UK-USA nations are no exception to this rule. A former agent takes up the story. I'm Fred Stock. My job at the communication security establishment from 87 through 93 involved uh, the message transmission and receipt of data in the communication center. They target our organizations like the Red Cross, the Greenpeace, um, other organizations, again, very peaceful um, environmental groups, uh, things that to nobody's mind is any kind of a threat, but yes, they, they targeted them 
always wanting to keep up to date what they're doing, who they're um, going to see. Uh, Amnesty International was a big one too, including who they were defending and try to free. Princess Di, when she was doing her thing against the landmines, uh, messages constantly where she's going, who she's seeing, how that group is trying to form, uh, what they expect to accomplish. The Queen, any of her visits, or the Pope, where he's planning to see, who he's going to see, who goes to see him. Since the early 80s, when my sources were there, most of their intelligence was not against enemies and not even against the Soviet Union. It was against all the neighboring countries in the South Pacific. It was against Japan. It was not because we were being, New Zealand needed to spy on Japan. We were asked by the United States, by the National Security Agency, to be part of a five nation system spying on all the Japanese embassies in the world. So while publicly we were told terrorists, enemies, communists, in practice it wasn't. It was, it was all our friends and trading partners. American law forbids their secret services from spying on their own citizens. This is an unwritten rule of spying worldwide. In 1983, a scandal broke revealing certain slightly unorthodox practices. Or how to get around the rule book when in a partnership of five countries. It would have been very illegal for the British GCHQ to listen to the communications of two of Margaret Thatcher's ministers who she thought perhaps were not really in her court. So we did that. We went to London and we did that work for the GCHQ. We were successful in, in hearing the communications of these two ministers and we just passed these audio tapes on to the GCHQ and what they did with them, we have no idea. Never, never will governments submit to that. But that sort of thing has been going on for years and years and years, and it continues to go on as I speak. But the UK-USA alliance went even further. Some companies are claimed to be the targets of the Echelon network. William Jefferson Clinton, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. In 1993, William Jefferson Clinton became President of the United States. His primary aim was to kickstart the American economy. Communism was dead. In the early 90s, America had to find new objectives. One of the most important became winning the economic war in which today's enemies are sometimes yesterday's friends. Fred Stock worked for the Canadian intelligence agency, the CSE, which was in permanent and direct liaison with the NSA. I read a direct message that redefined war in economic terms and with this new, um, new definition, they targeted new enemies under that definition. Suddenly now there was uh, Airbus and potential deals they were, they were running, uh, who they were selling to, uh, what type of prices, what the product lines were. It was all inclusive. And it wasn't restricted just to Airbus, it included um, uh, French arm dealers and sales. GATT was targeted. There were many, many, many messages on GATT. Um, World Trade Organization, many, many messages on the World Trade Organization. NSA does not report in any official way to Boeing or big US corporations. It reports into the Central Intelligence Agency, which processes information for the whole US government. Where that information is commercial, it goes to the Department of Commerce, where there's a special CIA section that receives it. That information can be used to guide an American business as to how to best win a contract. The information would be so filtered, the company wouldn't really know it, it was even from NSA. This offshoot of the CIA is directly linked to an interdepartmental agency, the Advocacy Center which is also housed at the Department of Commerce. 
nicknamed the War Room, the Advocacy Center gathers information from all the other American departments, as well as from the Secret Services. This information is handed on to companies in order to help them in their export strategy. Its website spells out the message. In the temple of capitalism, the state is there to help business prosper. That this particular motto is set in stone only shows how old-fashioned it has become. But of course, this version of the facts doesn't suit everyone. James Woolsey, CIA director from 1993 to 1995, and now a lawyer in Washington, D.C., explains why the Secret Services spy on foreign companies. If our continental European friends would stop bribing their way to contracts in the third world that they should be trying to win on the merits, we would have uh, uh, really no reason uh, uh, to uh, collect secret intelligence from them. I look at that statement with a jaundice eye and I, I smile. It's bullshit, yes. They weren't targeting just to see who's bribing who. I mean, yes, it was in there, but uh, the main impetus is uh, the technologies, the sales potentials, that type of stuff. One particular deal shows the full scale of the hypocrisy of the American version of events. In 1994, Brazil put out for tender the SIVAM project, whose aim was to ensure full radar cover of the Amazon. A strategically important deal worth $1.4 billion. America's Raytheon found itself in competition with France's Thompson CSF, who were confident of winning the contract. But in February 1995, the US press carried articles praising the CIA's success in Brazil, encountering attempted corruption of senior officials by the French group. The Echelon network probably enabled them to eavesdrop on such conversations. Accused of trying to corrupt officials, the French firm's bid was rejected and Raytheon won the contract. So far, so good. Mr. Woolsey's thesis stands up. But a few months later, the Brazilian press claimed that Raytheon had also been corrupting Brazilian officials. turns full circle. By discrediting a European competitor, the intelligence services help an American company to secure a new contract worth $1.4 billion to US business. And, as the cherry on the cake, the company in question is none other than one of those that built the Echelon network. Bill Clinton is right to thank his intelligence services. They deserve it and their huge budget is justified. You helped to strike a blow at a Colombian drug cartel. You uncovered bribes that would have cheated American companies out of billions of dollars. Your work has saved lives and promoted America's prosperity. I am here today, first and foremost, to thank you and your families for the work and sacrifices you have made for the security of the United States of America. <clears throat> I don't believe the Congress is doing a good oversight job. For example, on the House side, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee is a former CIA clandestine services officer. His, his name is Porter Goss. He's a congressman from Florida. Uh, how, how can one assume that somebody who actually used to work in that type of environment for the CIA is going to exercise any proper oversight over what any of the intelligence agencies are doing, including the NSA? 
in Canada, there's no governmental oversight on the communication security establishment at all. This has been one of the things I've been asking for for a number of years now. Uh, I believe they should have proper oversight and accountability to our own government. It's supposed to be a Canadian agency. This doesn't seem to be in place. As a matter of fact, it isn't in place. Uh, the only knowledge I have of them answering to anybody is simply the NSA and strictly the NSA. They're the only ones they take their answers from. I think people are basically kind of lackadaisical about it. They're kind of asleep. Um, they'll say, I don't have anything to hide. Why am I worried? Why should I be worried about it? Well, with that kind of attitude, you, that person may wake up some morning and find out it's too late to do anything. And what they thought was the case, I'm not doing anything wrong, it may one day be illegal, but then it's too late to do anything about it. Echelon is a major asset in diplomatic, military, and technological terms for the five partners. As the main target of the network's operations, Europe has decided it is time to act. In 1998, the European Parliament was made aware of the issue thanks to a report by Steve Wright, which was soon followed by the Campbell Report. The report dealt with the question of commercial espionage, as practiced by America's interception network. Questions were tabled in the European Parliament. According to an American proverb, in order to stifle an affair, all you have to do is create a commission of inquiry. The Europeans have made this proverb their own. In July 2000, Euro MPs voted for the creation of a temporary commission to investigate the Echelon system. It was given no power to act. On May the 8th, 2001, the commission members flew out to Washington. Their schedule included a meeting with the director of the NSA, his equivalent at the CIA, and a visit to the Advocacy Center. But at the last minute, all these meetings were canceled. The trip was cut short and rendered meaningless. The commission returned home empty-handed. Carlos Coelho, a Portuguese Euro MP, chaired the Echelon Commission. The fact that they cancelled at the very last minute meetings that had been scheduled a long time previously merely serves to highlight our suspicions. Different parliamentary inquiries or lawsuits from concerned citizens in Germany, France and elsewhere have no chance of getting anywhere. Everyone eavesdrops on everyone else, so no one can denounce their neighbor. I would roughly estimate that about 50 countries in the world have some form of signal intelligence of significance as, as part of their um, military and intelligence systems. The largest are obviously the Yakuza countries, plus China and Russia, France and Germany and, and Israel. But electronic listening systems for military or civilian purposes are sold to a far larger number of countries in South Asia and South America and so on. Uh, India and Pakistan uh, each use signal intelligence in their conflicts and so on. As far as commercial espionage is concerned, the practices of the English-speaking services are far from unique. Pierre Marion was head of French intelligence, the DGSE, from June 1981 to December 1982. 
conscience de l'importance du renseignement. C'était en 1982 que nous avons réalisé l'importance du rôle que l'intelligence pouvait jouer pour les entreprises que j'ai créé le département de commercial et technologique de l'intelligence. Et à partir de là, c'est développé tout un processus. C'était le début d'un nouveau processus. It involved, first of all, an agreement being drawn up between the company and the DGSE, of which I myself was the head for the whole of the first part of 1982. As a result, I met the bosses of every major company to ask them what they needed in terms of information. From that point on, our mission was to develop a system of intelligence gathering which could be used in ways that the companies had indicated to us. In 1982, the French company Dassault was competing with American and Russian companies for a contract in India. This is where the DGSE stepped in. Some of our agents had succeeded in infiltrating certain Indian military organizations likely to be a useful source of information on this issue. And our man on the ground was able to obtain for us the proposals of both our competitors. The funny thing is that we were able to communicate the information to Dassault or to their negotiator just as he was getting on the plane for India. He was able to negotiate a deal which undercut the other two and we got the contract. The intelligence community is a microcosm that has its own trade press. Guillaume Dasquier is chief editor of Le Monde du Renseignement. The spooks must read. Commercial espionage is not just a gadget to get a little bit ahead of the game. It is absolutely imperative because we live in societies which are increasingly wealthy, which need more and more money, and in which it is absolutely vital that major industries are export successes. And so the intelligence services, which are mere soldiers at the beck and call of the politicians in power, are called upon to assist those businesses that are the cornerstone of a country's prosperity. And it's the same story in every country in the world. No one has any limits in the extent that they will go to use spying on communications as a means of information, intelligence, and ultimately power. Bonnet was head of French counter espionage, the DST, from 1982 to 1985. We need a European echelon. It's the same as the nuclear issue. Balance is never established from the bottom up, but always from the top down. So we need to have the capacity to intercept the Americans in the same way as they have the means to intercept our communications. Only then will they take us seriously. Then we can talk and get some kind of agreement. But as long as we don't have a capability equal to theirs, the only thing that can happen will happen. They'll laugh down their noses at us. In order to set up a European echelon system, the prerequisite is that all countries should be on the same side. Two major European powers are in an ambiguous position. Great Britain and Germany both have US bases on their territory. And they are not alone. There is another ring of countries beyond the inner circle of UK-USA members who participate in the network. These shadow allies sometimes possess echelon-grade satellite dishes and collaborate with American agencies. They 
join into the networks and they offer the more limited exchange of intercepted material. There's a list of about 10 countries, which ranges from Norway to South Korea, which are supposed to have signed such agreements. We now know that there are two, maybe three Danish stations performing echelon type functions. Uh, these are substantial. They're clearly tied up to the Americans. The American intelligence services could thus spin their web all over the world to counter any putative European echelon system. The advantage for the USA is not necessarily being able to eavesdrop on the whole world, but rather to make other countries dependent while encouraging them never to attempt to develop their own system. In other words, for their intelligence gathering, they would always be dependent on the USA. Today, a power that does not possess autonomous channels of information gathering is a blind power. Merely by saying, I can give you information, I can offer you a system, you make the other country terribly dependent on you. Because later, 90% of the time, you can give the host country the information they require, but the other 10% of the time, you will be able to manipulate their access to the important information. Obviously, when they hand over information, they only hand over the information they want to divulge. They provide information that corroborates their analysis and suits their interests, and the rest goes in the shredder. The information war has begun. Controlling information across the globe is the new arm that provides supreme power. Thanks to their global intelligence gathering network, the USA can provide other countries with regular bulletins concerning their security in particular. These countries would be encouraged naturally to work in even closer collaboration with the USA. In the same way as nuclear superiority ensured leadership status during the Cold War, control of information will be the key to power in the information age. As always in intelligence matters, nothing is simple. In the race for strategic information, deals are made and alliances formed. Secret services work together and exchange information on certain affairs. We are both allies and adversaries. In our case, we needed to be able to access uh, certain communications coming from Warsaw Pact countries or from terrorist groups. So it was obvious that we sometimes required the help of the NSA. Personally, I remember asking the British, I would always ask the British, for certain information, which they would give us without any problem. September the 11th, 2001. Suicide terrorist attacks against the and the Pentagon. Over 3,000 people are killed. The fight against terrorism is one of numerous examples of intelligence services working closely together. But working closely together does not guarantee success. Intelligence gathering is not a precise science. It's a myth and a mistake to think that the NSA and its sister agencies can accept, can intercept all communications. They can't. Some are not worth collecting. Some are too difficult to collect in relation to the interest. In theory, they could have a method of collecting anything they want to. In practice, like everybody else, they have a budget. Well, you can't listen to everything. You take terrorists, for example. Uh, terrorists uh, communicate uh, electronically uh, very little. If one is going to uh, penetrate a terrorist operation and find out uh, when it's going to commit a terrorist act, it's almost certainly uh, only uh, going to be done uh, with spies. And uh, so I think for uh, a long time in the future there will be an important role uh, for uh, uh, intelligence officers and, and agents uh, in the 
human uh, intelligence uh, arena. Um, electronics are important and useful in protecting French and American security, but uh, they certainly won't do the whole job. Many reasons are put forward to explain the Secret Service's failures, such as the constant increase in the volume of international telecommunications, use of ciphers and transmissions by fiber optic cable, which confront electronic surveillance agencies with serious difficulties. Swimming in an unstemmed tide of information, they may not always have the means at their disposal to exploit all sources. The injustice these agencies have to suffer is that we only ever hear about their failures, never about their successes, the details of which must necessarily remain under wraps. But any conjecturing must not obscure the fact that we know nothing of the Secret Services, or perhaps only what they are willing to let us find out. Set against their supposed power, their failures seem to be inexplicable enigmas. The information war is still in its early stages.